Tonight we're going to do the last part, part three, of the series of studies that we have been doing for the last three weeks. And this is part three of understanding the mind of Christ. I have been spending a lot of time meditating and praying into this lesson because I believe it's one of the most important lessons uh, and necessary uh, teachings that we need to communicate to the body of Christ in relation to the renewal of our minds, or as the Paul, the Apostle Paul instructs us to let the mind of Christ be in us. And so we're going to go to our two foundational scriptures that we read for the past two weeks. The one is taken from 1 Corinthians 2.16 and the other one from Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Question mark. But we have the mind of Christ. Philippians 2, 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. As I have stated a number of times, in our previous lessons, that the mind of Christ does not work independently from our will. It's important for us to understand that. It is subject. The mind of Christ is subject to our will. And this is the reason why Paul says to the church in Philippi to let or to allow the mind of Christ to be in them. You will notice also that the Apostle Paul, in his epistle to the Colossians, he says the same thing, but using different words. Listen to what he writes to the Colossians, chapter 3, verse 12, through and verse 14 through to 16. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, Put on mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom you will see that he uses the words interchangeably, let or put on, which is the same thing. Put on these things. What things? The mind of Christ that is filled with tender mercies, filled with kindness, filled with humility, filled with meekness, filled with long-suffering. And then he says, above all, put on love. Or in other words, let the love of Christ rule. Then at the end of verse 16, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And if you notice, to the Ephesians, he writes again the same thing, using again different words. Ephesians 4.22, he writes to them and he says, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. As you notice, in all three epistles of Paul to these churches, he admonishes them to let or to put on this new man or this new mindset an attitude. He uses the word let or put on. And we see here an important truth. And it is this. God will not, and I repeat, He will not force His way of thinking on us, and He is not responsible for renewing our minds or responsible for putting on us this new mindset. He will not force his will. He will not force his mind, his thoughts, or the way he, or his emotions on us. This is something that we 
we need to let in, we need to put on. It is our responsibility to do this. We have to let this mind, which was in Christ Jesus, to be in us. And we have to literally put off, he says, the old man with his corrupt mindset and put on the new man, which is renewed in the spirit of your minds. And as I said last time, and we can see clearly here, that the battle of the mind becomes the most important battle in the life of the believer. And it is a battle that we must win if we desire to grow and to mature in the things of the Spirit. And remember, as I said last week, whoever governs the mind will ultimately govern the person. Simply because where the mind goes, the person follows. That's the principle, and and it cannot be changed. This is how things work. As I mentioned last week, uh, a quote by Zig Ziglar, he said, you are what you are, and you are where you are because of what has gone into your mind. You change what you are, and you change where you are by changing what goes into your mind. Obviously, he was talking about the renewal of our minds, the restoration of our minds. The mind of the Spirit which is the mind of Christ, is the key to an overcoming life. And I said that last week. It is the key that gives us access into the realm of the supernatural. And it is also the gateway of spiritual maturity or to spiritual maturity and to the formation of our Christ-like character, which, of course, gives us full access into our inheritance in Christ Jesus. So our thoughts, therefore, and perceptions, they become the cornerstone or the governing factor of our attitude and our behavior. Wrong thinking produces bondage. Right thinking produces freedom. The Bible says that the mind of the flesh leads to death and to corruption. If we allow the mind of the flesh or the carnal mind or the worldly mind, to govern, to dominate, and to lead us, it will take us away from God, and it will lead us to spiritual death and corruption. But the mind of the Spirit, which is the mind of Christ, leads us to life and peace. So the challenge we face, and this is the biggest challenge that the believer faces, No matter how old you are in the Spirit, no matter how many years you've been born again, no matter how many sermons you heard, the challenge you face and I face every day, it is to bring our thoughts, our will, and our emotions, which is our soul, in agreement with God's will and God's Word. And it's not an easy thing to do, but with the help of the Spirit, we are able to do that from day to day. In in order to do that, our mind must give access to the thoughts of Christ. Very important. And this is called, of course, as we say, the renewal of the mind, which another word for it is the restoration of the mind to its original state before the fall or the restoration of the soul. The soul is made up of our will, our mind, our intellect, and our emotions. These three must come in agreement with God's Spirit within us and the will of God, which is the same. The will, the Word of God, and the Spirit of God who lives within us must come into agreement. Someone asked a truly uh, veteran or a Uh, an experienced man of faith, a man who walked with God, saw many miracles, many visitations by the Lord Jesus himself, what did he consider to be a truly spiritual person? And his answer was very simple. He said, it is the person who has his mind and his will in agreement with his spirit, the new spirit, the born-again spirit within us. 
That's where God resides. A truly mature spiritual person is one who has his soul in agreement with his spirit. And if the two come into agreement, the body has no choice but to submit to the authority of the spirit and the soul. Now, we will answer the all-important question. How do we practically let or put on the spiritual mind which is from above? I know you know how to put your clothes on, how to take your clothes off, how to put them on. But how do we put off the old man and put on the new man? How do we practically do that? And I will explain. We do so by exchanging our thoughts with the thoughts of God. It is as simple as that. We exchange our thoughts because God's thoughts are not our thoughts, neither His ways our ways. He says, as far as the heavens are from the earth, so far are my thoughts from your thoughts. So what do we do? We renounce our thoughts and we receive God's thoughts. And this process by which we do this is called meditation. Write that word down because it's a very important word, and I believe meditation is a lost practice by and large in the body of Christ. The process by which we do this is called meditation. God's thoughts are revealed to us as we take time to meditate in the Word of God because the Word of God is filled with the thoughts of God, with the will of God. Amen? With the emotions of God. And the word meditate means, there's various words that define the word meditation, and here they are. It means to focus one's thoughts on. It means to reflect, to ponder, to mutter out loud, to engage in, to contemplate, and even to imagine. So meditating in the Word of God is vitally necessary for the renewal or for the mind of Christ to allow it to have his way within us and his attitude. And that's why I say meditation in the Word is by and large a lost practice in many believers' lives. They read the Word, but they don't meditate. They hear the Word, but they do not meditate in the Word. And the reason being is, let me explain it, I think this is it, they don't seem to have time for it or They do not consider it important to make time for meditating in the Word. And it's a pity. As a result of this negligence, the mind remains untouched and unrenewed. And we have believers all over the churches today. They've been in the Lord for many years, 20 years, 30 years, but their minds have not been touched. They think exactly like the world thinks and sometimes like the devil thinks. I'm not going to forgive that guy. You don't know what he did to me. I don't want to see him ever again. Those thoughts are not from Christ. They're not from the Spirit. They're from the carnal mind. And if you don't spend the time or make the time to meditate in the Word of God, to ponder, to reflect on what you read, it's not the much that you read. It's what you digest from what you read. Then your mind will not be touched, will not be renewed, and you will act just like you have never been born again. That's why Paul says to the Corinthians, you act like mere men, for there is so much jealousy, there's so much division, There's so much strife within you. You just behave like the people of the world. You haven't grown. You haven't matured because your mind has not been touched by the Spirit and by the Word of God. Now, how do I meditate? I need to make this so simple and so practical that even the least one of us can understand it. 
How do I meditate? Well, I'm going to tell you how I meditate, and I'm going to give you some practical examples as how I like to meditate in the Word. Can I do that? If you raise your hand, I'll go ahead. Praise God. Thank you. Take, for example, the passage of Scripture in the Gospel of Mark and Luke that relates to the four friends who climbed up the roof. They uncovered the roof, carrying the paralyzed friend in order to lower him down into the Lord's presence. Take that passage. Don't read too much. Just read that. This is the way I do it. And I ask questions. I ponder on that. And one of the things I do, I imagine. I visualize these men carrying this paralytic on a sheet or on a bed coming towards Jesus. I see them in my mind, with the eyes of my mind, I ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, what is it you want to teach me through this? You, you had Mark and you had Luke write this portion of Scripture and record the healing of this paralytic. What is it that you want to teach me today? What is it that you want me to learn? I ask questions. If you ask questions, you're going to learn a lot of things. The Spirit will answer your questions. Then I begin to imagine. I visualize. I visualize the scene with the help of the Spirit. I see them carrying, four of them, carrying this friend of theirs, paralyzed. I see them walking towards the entrance of the house, but they can't get in because it's blocked by the crowds. I see them going around the house looking for an entrance. The windows are blocked. The doors are blocked. The crowds, they are just like sardines. There is no room. Then I see them. I imagine. And I hear them talking. They say to one another, what are we going to do now? You know, we've come all this way. What are we going to do? How are we? We're not going to give up. And one of them says, let's climb up the roof. And the rest of them say, hey, good idea. I don't know how they climbed up the roof, but in those days, the roofs were not made of concrete. I remember my grandfather when I was a little boy. Every winter before the rains came, he would load up the donkeys and he would go out into the forest and he would bring clay. And he would use that clay on the roof because clay, when it receives the rain, it absorbs it. They used to put wood first, then they used to put other stuff on top of the wood, then the clay on top. But every winter before the rains came, he would bring this clay and spread it on the roof so when the rains came, they would absorb the rain and it would not leak. And we need to understand in those days, they didn't have concrete roofs, so they must have had some clay roofs, or else how would they make a hole or how would they break the roof? Either they had tiles or clay. And I imagine, I I see them. I see their determination. I see their unwavering faith. I ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, is there something you want me to learn from this? Teach me. Help me. We need to be teachable. We need to be humble. We need to have an open mind and an open heart and allow the Spirit to talk to us. Don't say the Lord doesn't talk to me. He talks to all of us because we are His children. The Bible says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. A stranger they will not follow. Believe that God will speak to you. God will show you things as you meditate, as you ponder. And I see them. I see them climbing up. I see them lowering the man down right into the presence of Jesus. And Jesus is teaching at this point in time. He is just communicating the word. And all of a sudden, here this man lays it in front of him. He stops. I imagine Jesus stopping, looking at the man with compassion and mercy. And he says to the man, your sins are forgiven you. Take up your bed and walk. And then I look around and I see the Pharisees' faces. I see the anger on the faces 
I see the hatred against the Lord. Who does he think he is? Is he God that he forgives sins? This is how I meditate. I tear that thing apart piece by piece and I listen while I focus and visualize and see the scene and asking the Holy Spirit to feed me, to help me, to strengthen, to encourage me through the words that I have just read. Amen? I'll give you another example. The woman with the issue of blood, just imagine, 12 years. The Bible says that she went to many doctors, many physicians. She spent all the money that she had. Instead of getting better, she grew worse. She's sitting isolated, not allowed to see anybody, to touch anybody. Nobody's allowed to touch her. Can you imagine the loneliness, the isolation, and the rejection of this woman having an issue of blood for 12 long years? from one doctor to the next, from one physician to the next, robbing her of all the wealth that she had. And here she is, getting worse. But somehow she heard. We don't know what she heard or who she heard, but she heard not Jesus. She heard about Jesus. She must have heard all the miracles that were done. She must have heard how compassionate, how merciful, how kind, that he doesn't turn anybody away, that he heals. He heals the leprous. He heals the paralytic. He even raises the dead. And when she heard what she heard, the Bible says faith rose in her heart. And I see that faith rising up, coming out of her mouth. And she begins to declare if I but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. The English translation says, she said, if I but touch the hem of his garment. But if you look at the Greek, it says, she was saying. The Greek word is eleia, meaning she was continually saying, if I but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. So I see her getting out of her house, weak and dragging herself somehow the faith that she received from what she heard gave her the strength in her physical body the courage and the determination to go where Jesus was can you imagine that that weak that that physically uh, withering away that little woman pushing through the crowds, the Bible says. She must have heard some awful, awful comments or statements. Hey, woman, watch what you're doing. You stepped on me. What's wrong with you? She ignored everything. And I see her with the eyes of my mind, pushing, shoving herself, dragging herself, pushing through the crowd, until she finally touched the hem of his garment. And the Bible says she felt in her body that she was healed that same hour. Nobody else knew or understood what was going on in that woman's heart at that moment. The relief, the joy, the feeling of being made well after so many years of having this terrible curse of, of an issue of blood running from her. Life was being drained out of her. And in one moment's touch of faith, she received her healing. Can you imagine the joy? Jesus himself, and I see the Lord, I hear him. Who touched me? You, you know the story how the disciples said, Lord, so many are thronging you. And you said, who's touching you? Everybody's touching. But there was one touch that stood above all. It was the touch of faith. And the woman, the Bible says, she fell down and she said, Lord, it was me. And you know the story, but I, I see it. I visualize it. I ask questions. Lord Jesus, so many of us in the body of Christ are crying out 
incurable diseases, cancer eating the bodies, neurological diseases that have no hope from medical science. There is hope in you, Lord. There is hope in you. Twelve long years, the woman never lost the desire, the hunger, the determination to get healed. She refused to let go and to sit in her misery and feel sorry for herself. She heard so many today hear about Jesus. But do they believe? This woman believed. Remember what Jesus said to her? Woman, your faith has made you whole. He didn't say my power made you whole. He didn't say God made you whole. He said your faith made you whole. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. That means if her faith healed her, my faith can heal me and restore me, can heal you and cause you to overcome whatever it is the enemy has designed and devised against you. I allow the Holy Spirit in my meditation. This is called meditation, folks. I allow the Holy Spirit to help me see and hear as I ponder and think on what I just read. I ask questions of the Spirit within me. And I know this, people who meditate in the Word, they hear things, they see things that others who do not meditate do not hear and they do not see because they haven't taken the time to sit for an hour and say, I'm going to meditate on this verse of Scripture alone and ponder on it and think about it and visualize it and see and ask the Spirit, what is it you want to teach me today through this portion of Scripture? Are you still with me? Praise God, I wish I could hear you sometimes. It won't feel like I am talking to people who can't speak. Anyway, let's go on. Back in the Old Testament, God instructed Joshua how to obtain a spiritual mind so that he can make his way prosperous and be successful in his mission. God wasn't going to make Joshua prosperous and successful. Joshua was to make himself prosperous and successful by taking what God has given him and putting it into good use. Let's read the instruction God gave to Joshua. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, a very well-known verse of Scripture. He says to them, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then you will prosper and succeed in all that you do. So Joshua was told to meditate in God's Word day and night, learn the thoughts of God, learn the ways of God, and renew his mind. In other words, letting the mind of God take hold of him. And every time Joshua went to battle, remember, he stopped and he inquired of the Lord. Lord, how do you want me to fight this battle? God would give him the mind of Christ. He would give him a plan for the battle and he would go and win. There was one time he didn't consult the Lord. And you know the story when they went up to a city called Ai and they were defeated. He didn't inquire. And so Joshua was successful in his mission because of his diligence in being obedient to God's instructions. And if you and I would take the word of God and do what he said to us, meditate in a day and night that you may observe to do all that is written therein, then you and I will make our way prosperous and have good success. And in the book of Psalms, chapter 1, we see the same train of thought, the same instruction, the same admonition, it describes the blessedness of a person who loves the Word of God and meditates in it day and night. Let's read it. It's only three verses here that I'm going to read. 
Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf shall not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Praise God. Let me say this, folks. We may have given our hearts to Jesus, but that's not enough, and I say that several times. We must also give him our minds through the process of continual meditation in his word. Reading the word is not enough. Spending time contemplating, meditating on what we read is vitally necessary. Hearing a message now and again is not enough to let the mind of Christ dominate our thoughts. We need to meditate, immerse ourselves in the Word, digest what we hear from God's Word, and allow it to permeate our minds before we receive the benefits that flow from it. Are you still with me? Our time is almost up. I'm going to say a few. I hope that I would finish this today, but I may not be able to. Let me ask this question, and then we'll go on. All of us know the Word of God says, do not fear, do not be anxious, do not worry about tomorrow. How many of us, though, live within the freedom of those words? Just one example. And the reason being is because we think we believe the word just because we know it in our heads. Let me me say this. Head knowledge or intellectual knowledge is not sufficient to inspire works or action. The Bible says faith without works is dead. Faith without corresponding action is dead. Head knowledge must become revelation knowledge. How? through the process of meditation. Head knowledge must become revelation knowledge through the process of meditation. If we stay long enough with the word in our minds, by pondering on it, confessing it, meditating on it, that which you know in your head will explode in your heart. That's revelation. When the heart or the spirit grabs hold of that, that's when you receive the power to act on it. But the spirit must grab hold of what is in the mind. The power to act on the word is called faith. And faith, the Bible says, is of the heart or the spirit, not of the head. Romans 10.10 says, with the heart man believes. Now listen carefully. This is where many believers confuse the two. But pastor, I believed. Well, if you believed, you would have the results. But I know I believed. Yes, I know. Okay, here, listen to this. The mind thinks, but the heart believes. The function of the mind is to process thoughts, but the function of the heart is to believe. We must not confuse the two. Head knowledge is not faith knowledge, is not heart knowledge. Many confuse these two functions. They're trying to believe with the mind rather than with their spirit. Well, <laughs> It would be so fun if it wasn't so ridiculous. 
It's like trying to walk with your ears rather than with your feet. Ears are for hearing and listening. Feet are for walking. The mind is to think and to process thoughts. The heart is to believe. When we believe with the heart, there is corresponding action. When we believe with the head, there is no corresponding action. The heart will always believe what the mind feeds it. This is the reason God instructed us to meditate in His Word day and night. So meditation in God's Word will feed your spirit with the right thoughts, with the right information, and with the right way of thinking, which will produce right believing. Are you still with me? When that happens, we will be able to walk in the freedom and the liberty of the spiritual mind. And the Bible speaks of strongholds. There are godly strongholds in our minds, but there are also evil strongholds. Speaks of arguments, speaks of high and lofty thoughts that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God's Word. And these thoughts are thought patterns which are inconsistent with the mind of Christ, and they, 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 how can I put it? They stump our growth. They hold us captive. And the Word of God command us to cast them down, to demolish them, because they give access to the evil one in our life. How do we do that? We do that by putting the Word in our minds, by meditating day and night until we feed our spirits with the right information and overthrow the evil stronghold or the wrong thoughts in our minds. God said to Jeremiah long ago, I'm going to put my Word, Jeremiah, in your mouth, and through my Word you're going to do one, two, three, four things and two others, six, you're going to first of all root out, you're going to pull down, you're going to destroy, you're going to throw down, and then you're going to build, and then you're going to plant. How did Jeremiah do that? Through the ministry of the Word. As we put the Word in our minds and meditate in a day and night, what are we doing? We are rooting out, we are pulling down, we are destroying, we are throwing down ungodly thoughts that are inconsistent with the thoughts of God and replacing our thoughts with the mind of Christ. And these strongholds, they come tumbling down. Because the Bible says we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. I think I'm going to end it there. I trust that I was able to help you practically. And I, I encourage you, I urge you, don't just read the Word. Take a portion of Scripture, a verse, two verses. Stay on them all day. Let the Spirit lead you and guide you to the right place and meditate on it. You go to work. Instead of listening to the news or the weather, think about what you've read. Roll it over in your mind. Learn it off by heart. Ask the Holy Spirit. You can do that while you're driving. You can do that while you are at work. Your mind is stayed on God. And the Bible says you will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word today. And we thank you for teaching us how to practically meditate in the Word. I pray that you will lay it upon our hearts, the importance of taking time to meditate, to sit at your feet, and to listen to you speak your Word to us directly. We want to hear from you, Lord. We don't just want to hear about you, what others say, what others preach, but we have a desire to hear directly from your Spirit. And I pray, Father, that you will give to your children 
an understanding and revelation of how important it is to make time to meditate in your word as you instructed us day and night. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for your guidance today. And I thank you for everyone on the go to meeting today. And I pray for them. I pray for the families. I pray, Father, that you would guide them to the right word. You would help them to use the weapons that you have given to us in order to destroy and to demolish thoughts of fear, anxiety, worry, um, anger, unforgiveness, prejudice, suicide, whatever it is that bothers them. And I pray that through your spirit you will empower them to overcome and to let the mind of Christ rule in the hearts and minds in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for today, and we bless you for it. Amen.